the, the way it has been structured and the living that has been uh, incorporated in this bill are not supposed to be levies as such, but I think uh, it shouldn't be money that is contributed to a, a, a trust or to a fund in the same manner that uh, NSSF is contributed so that uh, once you've done contribution over years, you can be able to claim back your contribution either in the form of a house or in the form of uh, the savings, just like uh, NSSF does. Because then uh, the question uh, uh, goes, then if, if we are going to contribute monies and then people are going to apply for loans, these loans are going to be paid back. These loans are going to be paid back. What happens to the initial uh, capital that has been uh, uh, contributed? Does it mean that uh, the government will then uh, divert that money to some other uses? That is not being informed by this bill. So I think I want to ask uh, the, the proponents of this bill to look into that. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, Madam Speaker, I am aware that uh, small business people uh, are going to close down because then uh, already they are struggling to pay the, the salaries and now a burden has been added unto them for, uh, to, to match the, the, the levy for the employees. Already people are struggling with the burden of paying that small uh, salary that they have been paying and now an extra 1.5% has been incorporated. So that means an increase uh, into uh, the salary that they are paying. The, the other issue, uh, Madam Speaker, is on the issue of um, the, the, the eligibility uh, to access to this uh, housing. Um, for example, when you go to the definition, the social housing unit with a plinth of that much, it targeted a person whose monthly income is below 20,000. I'm wondering where in Kenya, when you have an income of 20,000, how you can save money enough to be able to pay a loan for a house. Those houses, the cheapest is going for around maybe 2.5 million, almost 3 million. How many years will it take for someone who is earning, who has an income of 20,000, which income has to be distributed between uh, competing uh, needs of the family, including food and, and other basic needs. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want to go uh, very fast to the, to the board. The board is constituted to be able to, to distribute money to different uh, groups of uh, different uh, uh, implementers of the objective of the bill. Uh, the board is supposed to, to give 30% to National Housing Corporation, supposed to give 30% uh, to Kenya Slum Upgrading and Low Cost Housing and Infrastructure Trust Fund, is supposed to give 36% to the Minister of Housing, and then 2% goes to the collector, who in this case is KRA, and the administrator in this case, who is uh, the board. Now I'm wondering, how is the board going to be able to even coordinate and control all these huge amounts of money that are, are going to be given to different bodies of government? And then all these bodies have got an administrative arm in their component as they implement the project. Why then do we duplicate administrative cost in, the, in four different uh, uh, bodies of government when this money should have just been, if that happens, because of course I oppose, but I know the tyranny of numbers will play against me. But even when that happens, why don't we have a centralized way of just remitting the money direct from treasury to the implementers? Why do we have to, to break it down into three different uh, implementing agencies. And that is also going to uh, impact on, uh, on the cost of, uh, of, of implementing the, pro uh, the, the, the project. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want to ref uh, check you to the CEO, the qualification of the CEO, which is uh, clause number 21. If you read uh, clause number 21-2, a person qualifies to be appointed as a chief executive officer if that person has at least 10 years experience in managerial capacity in affordable housing matters, finance, investment, or banking sector. I'm wondering why this has been deliberately left amorphous. Because before you have experience, you must have requisite uh, academic qualification. And therefore, if we are talking about a CEO of a technical organization, that CEO must be a technical person. In this case, must be an engineer, must be an architect, must be a, a, a building economist, so that you understand what is involved in building. Buildings have components like a foundation. 
All buildings are based on a strong foundation. And if you give a quirk, because you know when you say that it's only experience that is required, there is no academic uh, qualifications that are preferred, then what we are saying is that anyone who has experience does not necessarily have to have an academic qualification. Then it means that uh, you can employ anyone as long as they have been managers, they could have been man managing a brewing company, or a managing a hotel or club, whatever it may be. So I think, uh, Madam Speaker, I want to say that if this will happen, that we are going to go ahead and, and pass this bill, the qualification of the CEO must be a technical person who has technical qualification over and above uh, experience. And I want to refer you to the section on corporate secretary, for example, on uh, clause number... Clause number 26, uh, one. There shall be a corporate secretary to the board who shall be competitively recruited and appointed by the board. A person shall be qualified to be appointed as a co corporate secretary if that person holds a degree from a university recognized in Kenya. So why are we silent on this qualification on the matter of the CEO? I think uh, I'm clear on that one. And then... Um, uh, Madam Speaker, I will go to the question of eligibility. On eligibility, for example, in uh, clause number 31, uh, 31, uh, 2, 2D, on the eligibility, there are, apart from all the, what they have said above there, such other information as may be determined by the relevant agency. Why, why are we leaving the agencies to be, able to, to be the one to determine? If we have a criteria of uh, how people should qualify to benefit from this, uh, this fund, then the criteria need to be set out in this bill so that we don't leave it uh, open for abuse by uh, the relevant agencies that have been mentioned here. Uh, Madam Speaker, I submit. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Kasarani. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, from the onset, I rise to support the Affordable Housing Bill. And as I rise to support, I want to just make it known to the House that this is actually the first time you are hearing my voice. <laughs> and I'm going to stick to the subject at hand, even though this is supposed to be my maiden speech. So I want to, I want to remind all the honorable members that I'm, I'm, I was elected as an independent candidate. Why I bring that up is because I did not have the luxury of having a national manifesto. But I read both manifestos from Kenya Kwanzaa and from Azimio. Both manifestos agreed on the need for housing. They agreed that it is a fundamental human right. They agreed on the rate of population growth and the migration to the urban centers. And they agreed that in Kenya we require approximately 250,000 new units per year. So, there are two things that we must recognize from this fact. Kenyans agree that there's a need for housing. The question is on how this is going to be implemented. I also happened to be in the housing committee, and we went around the country, and I must say that must have been the most advanced public participation exercise I have seen. Kenyans agree that there's a need for housing. The place where there's divergence is on several issues which can be cured and are already being cured by amendments to this particular bill. First, the first issue was the, um, the affordability of these houses. And most Kenyans really lamented on the fact that there was a deposit that was required to actually get access to the particular houses. That has already been cured in the amendments. And that's why I beg honorable members to please go through the committee report because most of the issues that are being raised today have been addressed in that report. Most of the other issues on allocation of the units, fairness in allocation, and job creation have been cured again with amendments. How have these been cured? It is by ensuring 
that wherever these units are constructed, they benefit that local community. All those things have been addressed by amendments based on the public participation exercise that was carried out by the Joint Committee. I think the issue that arises for most people are purely speculative. Why I say that is that in Kenya we have a culture of public funds being stolen. But I think, Madam Speaker, we have to get to a point as a country where we have faith that some development is actually going to happen. Otherwise, we will remain in the same state because we are now 60 years after independence. We have not been able to achieve Article 43 of the Constitution and assuring Kenyans live in dignity. It is about time that as a house we rise up and support to ensure that at least within the 13th Parliament, some of the things we support, we can be proud later on and say we have eradicated some of the issues that have persisted since before some of us were born. The purpose of this particular bill, even though it's tackling only housing, some people are saying we should ensure, first of all, that people have adequate food, people have jobs. But in terms of social and economic rights, they must all be achieved simultaneously. We cannot say, since not everybody has a house, then they don't go to school, because everybody, all our children need to go to school. Education is also a socioeconomic right. And therefore, we must strive and achieve all those rights at the same time. So we are already 60 years too late, Madam Speaker. And one of the things that we must ensure as members of this House, instead of opposing the bill, is bringing forth, bringing forth amendments of what we think should be changed. But both Azimio, Kenya Kwanzaa, and the people Kenya of Kenya agree that we need housing and there is a problem with housing. The public participation that we went through as a country, and everybody was watching, the number of jobs that have already been created on the sites that the affordable housing units are already uh, taking place has not been seen before. I had one of the members say that we don't need these uh, labor jobs or we don't need temporary jobs. We need all jobs. My people in Kasarani need these jobs. I have to advocate for this housing because we have a lot of people who live in rural areas who come to Nairobi to look for these jobs. They have nowhere to stay. It is a duty of the government to ensure that whether it's a rental or it's houses that people can buy, they have access to affordable housing. I rise to support Madam Speaker and I submit. Thank you. Thank you.